and people are coming in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Olympic Oval webinar series today with resilience and mental well-being. We're just letting uh, attendees come in and then we will start the session very soon. Thank you all for attending. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. We are just letting a couple attendees join the webinar on resilience and mental well being, and we will start it in just another minute. If you have any questions um, or things you'd like to post, there's a QA or a comments uh, at the bottom. Uh, if you click on that, and then we'll be taking questions um, probably throughout the session as well as the end. And if you want to provide any feedback, please do so in that form. Okay, I will stop the share and we will go to speaker view and Peter, if you want to lead us off, we are ready to go. Oh, Peter, Peter, you're just on mute there. There we go. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, I'm sorry if you technical button issues there. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, work through those through this through the webinar. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the second in our series of webinars, um, thank you for spending the time with us. Delighted to have you on the call. Um, we're presenting this on behalf of Sport Calgary, the Olympic Oval, and Active Living from the University of Calgary. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Olympic Oval at the University of Calgary. Um, a long-time triathlete, long-distance cyclist, having cycled non-stop across America. Um, as in my previous career, I was in the Royal Air Force, and as I looked to transition out of um, military service, I took a master's degree in sport and exercise science, and then published the work which was predominantly on sports psychology and the effects of mental health and mental, mental skills on, on performance with trainee pilots. And we really looked at how pilots can better regulate, how they can make better functional, more functional choices, um, and especially when faced with adversity. Myself, no stranger to the effects of things like PTSD during my career in the military and through head injury in some sports, mental health is an area of my life that I pay particular attention to. And when and work of this nature comes my way, it gives me great pleasure to be able to extend the conversation. I'm delighted to be, able to, to be able to open up this discussion today on that, the topic of resilience and mental health in the face of adversity. For those of you who were able to join us for the first webinar, we opened up this series by discussing the short-term future of sports when we look to exit from COVID-19 and what that might look like when hopefully that is behind us. But clearly there's work to be done to get through it. We talked about the specific preparations that we are making in the Olympic Oval and in the university to prepare world-class facilities for reopening and how the future of work and, and how we do things in sport may look very differently. We talked about bouncing back and the need for adaptability and resiliency. While that discussion was framed mostly around the facilities and the organization, 
we wanted to follow up that discussion with and bring the focus down to the individual level and the team level, acknowledging that sports organizations will have to change as they look to relaunch, so too will the people, athletes, coaches, trainers, parents, leaders, officials, and board directors will all face hard changes to the way we train and compete, and also the way that we run our businesses. We have to deal with, we also have to deal with the, the softer changes. And often when we think about change, um, that is often one of the things that is most hardest to cope with and often affects the, our mental side and also our performance and regulation. So this afternoon, we're here to talk about mental health resilience and how that affects us as we exit or look to exit from COVID-19. And, and I'm delighted really, I'm delighted here to be able to present um, three incredible um, panelists. Um, those of us who know them um, will um, acknowledge that they've had some great um, expertise and great depth in sport and they're no strangers to setbacks, successes, prejudices, and sometimes abuse, and many more challenges which have led them to embark on a path to shine the light on the ways in which people can best deal with mental health challenges. The importance of inclusion and diversity in our community is something that will probably lead us and, and, and guide us through the conversation today, and the need to, for each of us to look out for each other. So who better to have on this panel and discuss mental health, sport, inclusion and diversity, and to provide you with some useful tips on how to deal with the above than those that we have here today. Firstly, may I take an opportunity to introduce Clara Hughes, the six time Olympic medalist and the only athlete in history to win medals, uh, to win multiple medals, excuse me, in summer and winter Olympic games in speed skating and cycling, although she confesses to have virtually lived most of her life at the Olympic Oval. Clara is also an, an officer of the Order of Canada, which recognizes outstanding achievement, dedication to the community and service to the nation. The Order recognizes people in all sectors of Canadian society. Clara is the founding spokesperson for Bell Let's Talk, a mental health campaign designed to open up the conversation and break down the stigma attached to mental health challenges. Clara is currently a long distance hiker, having walked over 20,000 kilometers on trails around North America in the last five years. She was originally from Winnipeg um, and currently resides in Canmore, Alberta. So welcome, Clara. Our second guest today is uh, Riley Many Bears. Riley is a Canadian-born First Nations member of the Siksika Nation in Alberta and part of the Blackfoot Confederacy tribe. His Blackfoot name, and excuse me, Riley, if I don't quite get this right, is Iona Maka, meaning running buffalo. Riley is uh, a pedigree long distance runner. Um, in 2015, he, was, uh, he won the gold medal at the World Indigenous Games. In 2017, he was a bronze medalist in long distance running. He's also the AMA Youth Run Ambassador, a Spirit North Ambassador. He serves at the Siksika Health Services as a youth mentor and youth crisis worker for the SN7 program. And he's also a motivational speaker. So welcome, Riley. And thirdly, but lastly, may I introduce Elaine Hing, who's a mental performance consultant and founder of Elite Edge. For the past 14 years, Elaine has worked with Olympians, professional and amateur athletes and coaches to help them reach their peak performance with confidence. Elaine is currently affiliated with the Canadian Sport Institute in Calgary, the Olympic Oval in Calgary, and as, and as well as national team and professional athletes in various sports um, to, 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 to her portfolio. Her focus is on diversity and inclusion through sport. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Elaine to lead us off. Thanks so much, Peter. Appreciate the introductions. I'm Elaine. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, in this time of reconciliation, along with the spirit of gathering, it's really important to me to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Calgary, where I'm located today and where I know a lot of the viewers are located today as well. This includes a Blackfoot Confederacy comprising of the Siksika, Pakani, and Kenai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda. Uh, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. Uh, Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And here in Calgary, the meeting of the Elbow and Bow Rivers is just such a special place because it was a historical place of gathering and storytelling and ceremony and equality. And 
And I'd like to bring that spirit of gathering here today in storytelling as well, because as uh, Jamie and I were speaking, uh, stories are sticky, and I think we learn from stories a lot. So we're so fortunate to have these two athletes with us today. So even though we're gathering in a much more non-traditional way behind our computer screens today, I'd like to bring that, uh, that quality here today. So. Um, so many of you, uh, especially athletes on the call, probably think I sound a bit like a broken record sometimes. You know, I've had athletes come into my office sometimes with tears in their eyes, and they hear the same words over and over again from me. And it's the three priorities I have for them. My first priority is their health and safety, which includes their mental health. Uh, the second priority is their contentment. And the third is their performance. And very specifically in that order, because it's my opinion and experience that without the first two, the third rarely happens or it rarely happens in a rich and fulfilling way that is long lasting. So we really do wanna focus on that mental well-being. Um, it's important to remember that at this time of both COVID and social justice reform that many of you are reacting to an abnormal situation very normally. So distress, discomfort, uncertainty, these are all very regular reactions to a global pandemic. So, um, so recognize it when you're feeling this way. It is a pretty normal reaction to an abnormal situation that we're going through here. And you know, we might have heard in the past some people say throughout this that we're in the same boat and we'll get through this together and it's, uh, it sounds nice, but um, I'd like to suggest we might not be in that same boat. Um, the analogy I'd prefer to use is that we're in the same storm. The same types of things are happening around us, but we're, we're vastly prepared in different ways, many, many different ways. And some of us may metaphorically be on a yacht drinking margaritas while some other people are right there in the water with, uh, without hardly a life vest. So it's important to recognize as we're kind of coming back to training soon that uh, some people have been in a safe place and they've been training well and they've been, um, you know, having the opportunities that others may not and others aren't in a safe place or they don't have the resources or capacity to be training like other people are at this time. So recognizing that we may not know people's struggles because they're often personal and not really shared with others. So with stage two, particularly in Alberta being maybe moved up to even Friday, which is a bit sooner than expected, it brings some new opportunities and new challenges, which is really what we're talking about today is, is resilience as opportunity and challenge. So, um, most of the research that I pull on from resilience is from uh, Dr. Mustafa Sarkar. He is uh, at Nottingham Trent University, and he is sort of like the guru of resilience in my mind. He's dedicated the last 10 years or so of his life to this. And, and uh, he really likes to put it quite plainly, and I hope to emulate some of his, um, some of his plain language and uh, just sort of down to earth thinking. And, and what we generally wanna talk about is what resilience is, but also what it's not. And I think it's important that we talk about what it's not because we have, um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there too. So I wanna just go over a quick couple of things. Resilience is not a fixed trait. Um, just because you have resilience one time does not mean you'll have it forever or vice versa. It, uh, just because you haven't had it doesn't mean you can't build it. It's not found exclusively in a person. We may find someone who is quite resilient in relationships and maybe they struggle with resiliency in sport. Uh, again, it's not something you're born with. And one of the biggest things is to remember that it's not the absence or suppression of emotions. Emotions are really important to make sure that we're going through them and learning through our emotions and being able to express that. And it's also not necessarily bouncing back, but rather having the capacity to maybe make change before it's absolutely apparent that it's necessary. So um, how do we build resilience? What does it look like? What do we need in our environment? Uh, we wanna build a positive personality. And, and I mean, you all know Clara's like million dollar smile and her positive personality, how that comes through. So we're gonna be talking about some of, uh, some of these factors of resilience that, that she has. Um, we want to assess readiness as well to kind of help build this resilience, especially with things moving up to, to um, starting out Friday and then the Oval and the University are going to be rolling out an appropriate plan to make sure everyone's safe. I uh, want to make sure readiness is there too. So some athletes are going, not a chance I'm going to be breathing next to a bunch of hot, sweaty people and <laughs> that's not what I'm interested in. And other people can't wait to get back. And then there's some complacency as well of like, yeah, whatever, we'll kind of see what happens. Um, we want to make sure that in the training environment, we have a really psychologically safe environment. And that's when people really can foster that growth mindset of being comfortable with making mistakes and having some failure and learning and growing from that. Uh, and that's also when people can really take ownership of their own goals. 
Um, of course, we need to make sure we're having healthy and appropriate relationships between coaches and athletes and IST and staff members and, and uh, having that really supportive environment. And that supportive environment really does lean into what I know is kind of a buzz phrase right now, that psychologically safe environment. But that's where we can really foster growth. Um, Mustafa Sarkar talks a lot about focus and a lot of you athletes will say, well, yeah, of course I'm focused. You know, I'm racing this 500. That's all I'm thinking about in that moment. Um, but we need to make sure that focus is kind of going on and off and we can think of it like a light switch too, where we can't have folk and you'd never expect a golfer to focus for four hours, right? out there um, but we want to make sure that we can kind of flick it on and off and take those breaks when we need it because you know that rest and recuperation is really necessary to build that resilience um, it helps to strengthen our confidence too but the, one of the biggest things I'd suggest within resilience building is um, social support um, athletes have to know that they have access to social support and that can be their mental performance consultant a registered psychologist um, someone outside of their coaching field or teammates parents friends family it can be any of that but you know you've often heard me for the athletes on the call of like who is your support system who do you go to with this um, because the biggest thing is we have to know that that supports available and this might be a little bit surprising to many people is that even if it's not utilized we know that we can help to build resilience if they know that that support is there. So if we know that it's a fallback and we know that we can utilize that at any time, we might not even reach out and use it. But if we know it's there and it's provided to us, that resilience can kind of grow, which is, which is why it's kind of important to not just focus on that, like, you know, socially distance right now, but more physical distance and using those social connections. So, so basically the formula for resilience is high challenge plus high support but recognizing that that comfort's necessary too. So we wanna have that, that uh, healthy competitive environment, take ownership of our goals, um, but we really need to have that support from our teammates and coaches and any other underlying support that we may have. Um, and that's when we can really start to build that resilience. There are for sure times where resilience has been built without some of those support systems. Um, and we might even hear some stories about that today, but uh, it, for our best chance of success with resilience, that's what we're looking for is high challenge and high support. And that really comes down to environment. Um, and you know, when a flower doesn't bloom, you kind of, you fix the environment, not the flower, right? So we wanna make sure that we're working on fostering really great environments. So, so we're gonna jump into some questions here because we can kind of see everything uh, as a you know as a challenge or as an opportunity even pressure so we want to talk a bit about how we can build resilience through that and what has been done in the past so I'd love to open um, some questions up to Riley and Clara if you don't mind unmuting there and uh, I think it's important to talk about some difficult things that we've experienced in the past and as always as in any of our private sessions uh, please only share what you're comfortable with sharing with the group um, but we want to make sure that we're focusing on what we've done before because when we face new challenging situations We often feel like we've never been in that kind of situation before But if we really dig and open up that toolbox We recognize that we maybe had some kind of dry run in tough situations before and we may have some techniques or tools that we've used before that we could apply to this new situation. So, so I'd love to ask and, and Clara if you don't mind um, I'll start with you to, to ask really what is something difficult that you've experienced before? You know, have you had kind of a dry run and in tough situations and uncertainty? And I know a lot of you know Clara's story, so you're going, yeah, she has, <laughs> but I'd love for you to share that with us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but you know, I, I, I wanna go back a long ways and after my first Olympic games and I was a young cyclist and came away from my first try at the Olympics with two bronze medals for Canada. And, and quite honestly, I was not prepared for the collapse that happened after that. And a big part of, you know, the maturity I have now as an adult, and, you know, this is 24 years ago now, 23 years ago, I can look back and I know, I know clearly that I had misunderstood the, the meaning of success mm -hmm. and the value of success. Personally, I thought that if I was a successful person, and success um, defined in the world of sport as you know being on a podium, winning the Olympics, winning the Olympic medal. I thought that it was going to heal a lot of turmoil that I had going on inside. At that time in my life, I was 23 years old. I had no understanding of the ongoing effects of trauma, particularly early childhood trauma. And I actually thought that by winning something, everything was going to be okay. And this, this just broken self was going to come together 
and be fixed. And it, it was not that. It is not that for anybody. And, and I did have a mental collapse after those Olympics. Um, I did not have the tools <laughs> nor the maturity. It was a very different time in sport. There was not this conversation happening at that time in sport. Um, but what helped me out of it ended up being um, a different coach. And this coach, uh, and he was my second cycling coach, a wonderful man from Quebec named Eric Vandenine. And a lesson that Eric Vandenine gave me at that time and continually repeated throughout you know, my life and not just speed skating, but, or in cycling, but when I went back to speed skating, then back to cycling again was that he would always tell me I was a Formula One car. He's like, the car is in great shape. It's the driver I'm worried about. So <laughs> Elaine, it goes back to you saying, it's like, if a flower is not blooming, you don't try to fix the flower, you fix the environment. You know, you fix the environment to make sure that that flower has everything they need, the, the nourishment, the, the supports to bloom. And, and for me, it took a long time to learn that. So really, you know, I think that you can gain, you gain those tools if you're lucky through experience. You don't gain them alone you receive those gifts of support and, and understanding and education and empowerment, and hopefully you gain resilience through the help of others. Right. Oh, awesome. Thanks for sharing yeah. that story. And, and Riley, I'd love to ask you the similar question. You know, what are some difficult situations you maybe have faced before and, you know, having that sort of dry run, so to speak, and those tough situations or uncertainty? Yeah, you know, uh, coming from my personal experience, you know, being a minority and a First Nations person of Canada, you know, um, I faced a, um, you know, a couple, about seven years ago, my dad passed away around this time of the month. And so, you know, of course, I was coping with depression and not only that, but um, anxiety and that I really didn't know how to open up to like family and friends. But what really helped me during those, um, that dark period of time in those months was, you know, being active, you know, like just using physical literacy being active every day and only that but um mm -hmm. I would say just connecting to our land because I was running because I came back home just to like heal you know stay with family and friends and you know it's being outdoor and active and so um that, that that's what really formed my healing therapy not only that but also uh going back to our original ways you know taking part in face painting sweat lodges and pipe ceremonies and so um that's what really uh, got me back into uh, a normal conscience I would say like a positive conscience and so um and then uh, I had this opportunity to get back into sports but at that time I was pretty much lost into my addiction you know drugs and alcohol and you know it's very common in First Nation communities that you know that these uh, problems occur you know teen suicides uh, teen, teens are into drugs and alcohol dysfunctional environments dysfunctional families and you know it all goes back to trauma you know the residential school system I'm a third generation. My uh, late grandparents experienced sexual, physical, and verbal abuse. And so they pretty much passed on that trauma onto my family. And my, fam my parents passed that trauma onto me. And so right now, you know, I know that our third generation is going to uh, prevent that for the next, you know, couple of generations. And so, um, and so, yeah, you know, I'll get back to the point. But, you know, like getting back into sport, I didn't want to at, this, at the time, but, you know, I was very glad that I took the opportunity to get back into this sport, which was distance running. I didn't know that, I guess I had a, a great passion for it. And I was a natural athlete because, you know, I'm a descendant from the legendary runner Deerfoot, who would have a Deerfoot trail off in Calgary. And so, yeah, that's pretty much my little story there. And I could go on if I would need to. That's really awesome. And, and was it your brother that sort of uh, helped to force you back into running a little bit, was it? Yeah, you know, like, um, so this was the 2014 North American Indigenous Games, and I was, just, I was just didn't want to. I was so done with sports, and I just, you know, didn't want to. But you know, he pretty much got me on Team Alberta without my consent, and you know, he knew that <laughs> I still, I still had talent. You know, I was really, uh, I would say I was really pissed off at him, and then I ended up getting some, getting a letter saying, "Oh, you've been selected." I was like, "Oh crap! All right." And so I pretty much, I pretty much uh, had to train in like under a month, six weeks. And, but, you know, I made the amazing choice because, you know, it was like that moment, you know, short story short, I ended up winning a few gold medals and bringing them back home for Alberta. And so that was, that was a positive turning moment for me because, you know, being on that podium, you know, it was a proud moment. I said, you know, this is a great feeling. I, I you know, I, I want 
more of these moments. And so I just pretty much stuck, took my athletics serious. And then, so yeah. I, I love how humble you are, Riley. And it's like the North American Indigenous Games. It's a big friggin' deal. And he's like, oh, so I yeah. came up with a few gold medals. And yeah. uh, that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And then, started yeah, and then, and then a year later, um, I got asked. I got asked to represent Team Canada at the first annual World Indigenous Games under Brazil. But wow. at that time, I was facing a health issue, a health barrier. I was diagnosed with a severe heart disease called full Parkinson's. And mm -hmm. so, for those who don't know, it's something to do with the valves, and your heart rate goes extremely high once you do physical activity. But you know, I was a little nervous. You know, I I said yeah. I didn't consult with my family. I didn't let them know that I was going and was on Team Alberta and whatnot. But uh, but I you know. Something that I I had faith I had uh I had faith in my culture you know the God Creator not BC you know I pretty much took part in those um those ceremonies that really helped me heal and so I just had before I went to the games prior to before that I was really ashamed being First Nations because you know there's always these negative stereo comments about us being you know dirty Indians you know deadbeats the life's not going to go anywhere and you know they don't really know what it's like to live on a reservation you know I grew up in a very dysfunctional environment, drugs and alcohol, you know, teen suicide, you know, I lost a few cousins to suicide who I had amazing childhood memories with, but, you know, I just had faith, and I ended up getting my black name before I went to Brazil, you know, just, uh, you knew uh, me and run Buffalo, and then they told me this amazing story about, you know, all these, once the storm comes, all these animals would always turn back, but a buffalo keeps marching through the storms, and, you know, one of the elders said, you know, you went through many storms in your life, but you never gave up. And so going to these games, the opening ceremonies was probably the most highlight moment of my life. You know, I still get chills and wow. you know, seeing all this indigenous culture coming in together. I won't say celebrating sports, but celebrating the ways of our life. And I felt mm -hmm. really proud to be indigenous at that time. And then race day came. It was, it was, in, the, it was in the heart of Brazil. It was humid, humid, uh, mid 45. And it was just at the time uh, I ended up, uh, and winning gold medal became a world champion, but you know, I still to this day I ask myself, like, oh wow, how did I end up winning that race with a severe heart disease that nearly killed me? But it's okay wow. though. So speaking of resilience, hey, and and I mean, who else got chills of that story of uh, of your Blackfoot name? That's pretty cool, uh, and how fitting, how fitting that that's uh, that's your Blackfoot name. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. Yeah, yeah, so, so I, I guess um, moving on to another question, you know, what are some of the, we see that, you know, Riley really connected the land and your culture again, and, and maybe Claire, what were some of the coping mechanisms that you really used at those times of crisis? And, and, you know, or maybe what do you wish you knew at that difficult time that you know now, and that could be coping mechanisms or just lessons that you, you kind of wish you knew at that point. Yeah, it's interesting looking back, and I mean, I guess I'm looking back, I'm a lot older than Riley. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably both of you too. Um, but uh, it's really looking back over the years and realizing that a, a big part of sport, what sport was for me as a young person, it actually was a continuation of, of addictive issues, addiction issues. Um, it was a way for me to go all out in something and to cause pain to myself emotionally and physically so as not to fa have to face these really difficult things that were going on inside um, that manifested and ended up in depression, ended up in disordered eating, um, ended up into spells back into addictions with drugs and alcohol. And sport was kind of like my in-between coping mechanism in a very unhealthy way and so when i matured as an athlete and through a lot of help from trained professionals but also you know as riley shared the traditional ceremonies of indigenous peoples and first nations peoples um, have been very powerful in my life i've had the, the great gift of been invited to ceremony and experienced um in my own way as a non-Indigenous person, some of the healing that, that Riley mentioned, and um, it's been profoundly in, impactful in my life. Um, there have been so many, many lessons that I've learned that allowed me to realize that I was going about sport as I was going about drinking, as I was going about disordered eating, as I was going about drug use, um, and it was really a form of self-harm. And so I had to learn to do less. I had to learn to 
no one enough was enough. I had to learn limitations and actually sitting, setting and sticking with those limitations um, so that I could actually be, reach my potential as an athlete in a healthy way as a human being. And it was a very, very difficult balance to find um, in sport and actually in life as well. Because sport, it, I, I used to think like, oh, when I quit sport, all this stress will be gone and, and I'll be a much happier person. And it just doesn't happen that way because the, most, the common denominator wherever you are is you. <laughs> you are always there. So if there are issues or dysfunction or imbalances, you're, you are always there. And so it goes back to the driver of the car. How do you work on the driver of the car? And, um, and so for me, yeah, it definitely was a way of, my my way of of healing and and and, a, uh, and going through sport as a healthier person and ultimately winning the olympics because of that pursuit was less it was not more mm, that's pretty amazing hey it's interesting because yeah. you would think it would be more always yeah. more higher faster stronger yeah. and you know honestly not even just in the time of covid and the global health pandemic i think the lower slower gentler is a more sustainable thing that can lead to the higher faster stronger mm, that's pretty cool mm. so you would so you would say that your toolbox is kind of filled along the way but you essentially mm. use i know one of your um something that you often talk about is how movement is your medicine and i think that's really beautiful because you used movement um almost with an addiction before and how you've learned to transform that into healing yourself and continuing your health along the way would you say that mm -hmm. movement is kind of at the top of your coping mechanism toolbox yes right now i mean in, in my life absolutely i'm a, i'm a creature of endurance just like riley <laughs> <laughs> we're endurance athletes and you know and and but also i would so i would go beyond that and i would say that it is connected movement connected movement. Bruce Lee, one of my favorite quotes what, from him was, the consciousness itself is the greatest hindrance to the proper execution of all physical movement. And that means you practice, you practice, you practice. And in a sport like speed skiing, very technical, it is an overload of all the systems to the point where you feel like you can't skate. And then you have to let go of all of that and just let yourself move and let the freedom of movement, train movement happen through you in a connected way. And wow. so it's connected, beautiful movement. That's pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. And Riley, I'm assuming over the last few years, you've really kind of added to your toolbox. And it sounds like a, a really common thread throughout your healing and moving forward to uh, continue resilience is really connecting to the culture and to the land. And would you say that there's anything else that you kind of topped up your toolbox with over the years to, uh, to kind of help you move forward with it? Um, so yeah, like with myself, um, after my, uh, my gold medal victory from Brazil, uh, I came back and of course, uh, you know, being a full-time struggling athlete, uh, you know, seeking some financial support. And, um, uh, uh, once I came back home, um, you know, like I mentioned before, you know, like it's common in first nations that there's, uh, drugs and alcohol. And then, so of course I ended up celebrating and then ended up getting, um, uh, end up getting on with uh, the six guys sent them program which uh, had developed at very summer of 2015 and my brother at the time was working he's probably one of the OG founders or something and um and he pretty much asked me if I want to work and I was like oh yeah sure you know make why not make a few bucks throughout the month and and sure enough I got pretty much attached to it and I met some amazing individuals at six guy health services who I know not through like uh, events but not get to know them personally and uh, not only that but I really developed my skill with um with uh, all this youth crisis training, being a mentor and, and whatnot, and knowing that, but um, with other, also my side job too, becoming this motivational speaker, in which I ended up, uh, you know, trying it out. I never like spoken like crowds before, but you know, before that I was, I'm like, I'm very shy, very quiet. And once you get to know me, I'm like very outgoing and, you know, but you know, it's a, it's a learning lesson, but you know, I'm very grateful for the tools I developed over the years. And, and sometimes I have to put my train on hold because there'll be a crisis call in the First Nations community where they do like a, like a youth suicide and I'll go up there with other crisis, some health services and whatnot, crisis staff. And so um, let's go to their brief and not only that, but all, with all the times I go out there, would always get uh, great feedback from my presence. So, you know, saying that 
uh, that, you know, we're doing a great job and, you know, like myself and some of my other staff at SN7, like really uh, engage with the youth. Sometimes we'll be like just playing like uh, kickball or baseball with them and whatnot. And we just have a good old time with them. And, and um, so, yeah, and I decided to like become drug and alcohol free because I want to break that barrier, that stereotype stereotype among first nations youth and you know right now i'm about four and a half years sober right now so that's oh congratulations yeah that's amazing yeah you know when we speak of intergenerational trauma and uh, how things are passed through it takes so much support and courage and resilience to to move through that and to stop a pattern and so a huge congratulations to you and i think it's amazing that you know working um with high risk and with um with crisis intervention it's there's so much research out there with regards to building our own toolboxes and feeling content with ourselves when we're helping others um there's a lot of it uh, dealing with gratitude and happiness like dr martin seligman's work and it really talks about how even if we do something very small for someone else and we continue that over time, it really kind of increases our own self-confidence and our own contentment with ourselves as well. And like kind of circling back to that positive attitude, that really can foster resilience in us. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, Clara, what's, what's the best advice you've ever been given? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, I mean, there's been so many advice, but I'm going to go to my husband, Peter. Um, Riley knows Peter really well. And uh, Peter, he's, he's said many things to me over the years, but, and we've been together 24 years this uh, coming wow. November. So um, he's one of my, perhaps the greatest teacher in my life. And as an athlete, the advice that he gave me, and it was around in 2000, around 2000 when I was thinking about coming back to speed skating and I thought well you know I'm a professional cyclist I'm giving up my salary my contract everything my sponsors to go and try and be a speed skater I was 27 years old and and I had this dream and I'm like god I want to skate but maybe I should go next year and maybe I'll wait and and it was just like I just couldn't make the move of just being like okay I'm leaving everything I have and I'm going to go and earn my place. And I was terrified to do that because you have all the what ifs, like doesn't work out. And what if I'm making a mistake? And anyway, and he just said to me, he's like, Clara, you think you're gonna have this passion, this desire to go and do something like this, to turn your world upside down. He said, do you think you're gonna always have this? He said, your body will be able to do these things long after your passion leaves you. And he said, if you feel this, go and do it and go and do it now. Don't wait. Wow. And that was profound advice. And I took it and um, it led to 10 years at the Oval <laughs> with everybody there. And I just want to give a shout out to you know, everyone at the Olympic Oval, at the University of Calgary, with the, the national team. Um, thank you so much for all of your patience with me and, and the support you gave, the community of volunteers, like everybody there. Um, I did used to call it the Petri dish, <laughs> which is ironic in this time of global health pandemic, but it was always like, you're just terrified of getting sick because of the university and just so many people all the time. And I'd be like, I'm going to the Petri dish and I'm, my immune system suppressed from training. But, um, but I was just really grateful for everything. And that advice from Peter led me to those 10 years and it led me back to the bike for another summer Olympics in London, England in 2012, my last game. So I took that advice to heart and you know what? People always ask me, how do you know when you're done? Like mature athletes or athletes contemplating retirement from sport, how do you know? And I always tell them, it's so cliche, but you really just know. <laughs> you really, really, really just know, you know, unless it, it is a, an accident or something like that that stops you. Inside, I was like, I no longer care about this. I'm done. And that was it. And that's what Peter said. The passion will be gone long before your body is, wow. is in, incapable. It mm. really lined up then. Hey, that's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> Riley, what is some, uh, some of the best advice you've been given or even advice you would have for current athletes? Is there other current athletes? You're still a current athlete. Um, when they navigate coming back to train, I know you were training for the Olympic trials for Tokyo when COVID hit and that definitely threw a wrench in your plans. So uh, what is some advice that uh, you've been given or you would give others? Uh, so the advice I've been given was from elderly to the youth. You know, uh, going back to one of my elders, uh, my late grandmother, you know, she, um, 
Uh, I think it was about in junior high, high school. I remember um, I was kind of like complaining because I wanted to go to the school dance because uh, one of the pretty girls asked me if I wanted to go. And I said, sure. But, you know, at the time I was, you know, we we're as a family, we we're struggle, struggling financially. And um, I was trying to look for a ride. And then, you know, I was kind of like, you know, very bickering. And then my, my late grandmother told me to come and, uh, and she told me to talk. So let me sit down. I was like, okay, like, what's up, grandma? She's like, you know, part of my language, but she's like, you know, stop your bitching. <laughs> I was like, okay. And she's like, no, 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 let me tell you. And she told me like the amazing story about never complain in life, you know, things come and go, you know, like there'll be many more moments down the road, you know, it doesn't matter how old you, you'll obtain it. And so I just, you know, very uh, grateful for that advice. And, you know, she told me just never complain in life, whether you're poor, rich or stable. And so I just took that advice till this very day, you know, some days where I'll be behind, behind some few bills and I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm going to go back to that moment where my grand, like grandmother said, you know, just don't complain about life, you know, just take that, take the day as is and whatnot. And so I'm very grateful for that advice. And, um, and then my sister, you know, uh, I think it kind of uh, goes the same with my other mentor, uh, Billy Mills, who told me, it's kind of like the same, similar advice saying that, um, you know, it takes time to heal a broken soul, you know, not only that, but um, Billy, you know, uh, for, for you guys don't know, Billy Mills, he's a Native American who won a gold medal at the 1964 Olympic, uh, Tokyo Olympics in the 10,000 meter race. And so, um, you know, he's a great uh, friend of mine, great mentor, and uh, I'm proud to say that he's my adopted grandpa and he takes me as his adopted grandson. And so it's just that, you know, he said that, you know, because he grew up in a very dysfunctional environment. You uh, contemplated suicide. You know, he grew up an orphan, just like I, just like, just like I. And um, he said, you know, uh, a goal can heal a broken soul. And so I pretty much had a goal, which I um, wrote down about five years ago. And then, you know, my sister says, you know, it takes time to heal a broken soul. And I was like, wow, that's, that's very great. And so um, I think my personal advice, um, yes, I was trained for the Olympic trials. I was actually supposed to be a, uh, in Kenya you know I've been going there for a while now and um it's amazing out there and um you know like when this COVID hit I was of course people are really devastated because they had their plans you know whether it's upcoming graduation you know training for a sport or just any kind of events and whatnot and you know people were a little upset and devastated you know we're all in this together you know as you mentioned before you know in the same boat but then again none of us are in the same boat exactly Mm -hmm. but you know like I'm just gonna say that you know, our time as individuals will come, you know, it doesn't matter how well you attain it, you know, just take life as it is. And right now I'm just, I would say I'm kind of enjoying this freedom, like back chill out time. Actually, I uh, haven't been training as intensely as I used to right now. I just pretty much stay active every day. Just, okay. you know, uh, drink. Um, sometimes I have an unhealthy meal and I have something unhealthy beside me and <laughs> got my water here got my water here it's almost out but um yeah you know pretty much just uh enjoy your downtime and you know spend time with your family and of course you gotta still follow uh safety procedures you know physical distancing and yeah. and whatnot but you know i'm very uh grateful for uh claire hughes i met about four years ago and um uh, i remember i came in the health center and she just came out of nowhere with her smile and she's like you're really mini bears and i'm like wait you know who i am and then i just <laughs> became a fan and you know she had her book and, and of course at that time um she spoke about mental health and I knew I heard about mental health, but I just didn't really, um, you know, didn't really know how to cope with it. And I read her book. I loved her book and I don't know how many times I read it. And, Aww. you know, she gave me hope about, uh, you know, it's okay about the mental health and, you know, it's okay to speak up about it. And, That's and over the years and over the years, I've been grateful just to, you know, just to have a close friend to talk to, you know, sometimes I'll message Claire for some advice and she'll give me some advice back. And I'm just very uh, grateful for the friendships I have with uh with my many friends family and of course claire as well so you're utilizing your support system well that's great (laughs) and controlling what you can control right and that's kind of like some of those final tips we talk about is uh you know um making sure you're staying socially connected to your your friends and family and teammates and that social support that you have and a big one is focusing on what you can control right of course maintaining a bit of a sense of routine when you can and some structure so glad you're being active every day still and i know for claire that's something big for her as well and uh, utilizing that mental recovery so even with like the focus light bulb on and off um, using that for ourselves too to make sure that we're we're kind of maintaining that control and so peter as a former military pilot you must have had experienced some moments of uncertainty and crisis 
Um, are there any coping mechanisms that you use that you'd like to share with us before you give our final message and we go into a short Q&A? Yeah, thanks, Elaine, and some great stories coming out. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that really bring to come, come to mind. And I, re I recall when I was first being taught how to fly, I remember an instructor saying to me, like, you're just holding on too tight uh, onto the controls, you know, and it would be like I was fighting the airplane. Um, and, you know, he used to say to me, like, just relax your fingers, relax your toes and breathe, you know, and, you know, when we think about like sport and we think about regulation in sport, like some of those things are, those practices are, are key to our performance and being able to notice and identify, you know, what's going on in, in the inner self so that we can control what happens in the outer self. So. Um, the other the other piece of advice that you know I was once given was you know to learn and it was I guess it wasn't just advice I was we were often taught in the military to to compartmentalize things so you know whilst we may think we've got this overarching humongous our big audacious goal then how do we break it down like and learn how to break it down into small pieces and like you say Elaine like figure out what are the controllables and control those and work have a plan and and then you know. You, you can't you can't control the uncontrollable so let it go and don't stress over them so um for us that was key and, and also writing writing things down and having good habits around like what we do before we do something in the air so planning you know and writing down a plan and then talking about it and talking it through and rehearsing it and mental rehearsal and these are probably all things that you know ring true for for us as athletes and then you know reflection so what do we do on reflection after the fact and not even during what do we do what's our self-talk during and how do we stop ourselves from beating ourselves up in the in the moment so those sorts of things are are you know are, are key to me and even when i was working with athletes and coaching sorry with pilots and coaching them they would often present to me with you know this self-deprecating self-talk um which which wasn't functional at all and it was you know bringing their performance down and when you're in the training environment it was it's always very difficult to try and get yourself out of that hole so so those are those are some of the key learnings i've found that helped helped me and i've you know i've shared with others to help them very cool thanks for sharing now jamie i know that you've been uh, moderating some questions they come in privately to you and on the and on the main chat um are there any questions you'd like to ask our panelists yeah, there was actually a public question for you, Elaine, was about any uh, literature or references to go deeper into the topic. Um, and I think Riley already spoke about Clara's memoir being uh, being one uh, that has influenced him. So if you had any tips about that, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Um, so literature about resilience, I'd recommend looking up anything from Fletcher and Sarkar. If you Google Mustafa Sarkar, M-U-S-T-A-F-A, S-A-R-K-A-R, -A -A um, it's like he's the guru of resilience and you're gonna get everything you need there, that he's great. I also really, there's a, a doctor I really like, Gabor, Gabor Mate is his name, and he has studied extensively trauma and addiction. Um, I have one of his books to show here. This one is about addiction in the realm of hungry ghosts. And the book I really liked from him, which it helped me understand profoundly early childhood trauma and the effects of trauma um, is called uh, When the Body Says No, The Hidden Cost of Stress. I wish I had written, read, read that as an athlete. It would have helped me understand all, a lot of what was going on in, inside that, um, and it saved me, it has saved me thousands of dollars of therapy. <laughs> Uh, speaking on on trauma, in the, there's a great book called The Body Keeps a Score. It's by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, I believe, and uh, he's also known as as one of the forefront in trauma research. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in that side of it, so mm -hmm. here's a question, and uh, I don't know how you could answer, but um, Elaine, Clara, Riley, I mean, this is an open question to you. You know, it, as we think of like a return to sport, and I appreciate you know whilst we've been in lockdown, athletes have been doing their level best to try and emulate the sport or the activity that they're become most familiar with but understandably they'll be you know super keen to get back into it you know you know i was at repsol sports center and i'll plug for them on this call but um before i joined the olympic oval and i can just imagine some of the athletes down there similarly the speed skaters you know speed skating canada's talking to us regularly about when we can reopen T talk to us about like what is it like to come back to you know, having had a layoff and what sort of things do we need to be mindful of 
what sort of things do we need to look out for so that we don't you know run the risk of maybe overtraining or you know jumping into that sort of black hole where we think oh my god i'm not as good as i could have been or as i was six months ago so what what sort of words of advice or sort of tips or techniques could you share that might help athletes yeah i would say that the main thing is sort of um, assessing readiness from those different groups um, like I mentioned before, some might be really keen to get back and others might be quite hesitant. So seeing what kind of adaptations can be made. But what we can really do is look at this uh, similarly to coming back from an injury. So training levels um, won't have been the same for sure. A lot of people are, are doing everything they can, um, but it's not quite the same. It's not with a training group. It's not face to face with your coach. Some things are going to be a little bit different. So we can almost look at it similarly to coming back from an injury. And what are the steps we need to take for that hierarchical training? Um, to start where we're at and to be okay and comfortable with where we're at at that moment so that we can build it and to do so creating that psychologically safe environment because we know that there may be some struggles and failures along the way just based on the current situation. Great. Clara, what about you? Um, I, I think that, I mean, I could, in all the years of sport, I had a number of teammates who were really great trainers. They were, they were world champion trainers. And when it came time to race, racing is such a different thing. So really just to keep in mind that training is training and it comes in all shapes and forms. Like, honestly, I trained as a cyclist and then I come to speed skating. It, in my latter years as a speed skater, my first month of training, I did nothing speed skating oriented. I, I didn't even do any structured training. It was just long distance hiking, long distance bike touring. Um, it all feeds the same place. But just know clearly where you're trying to go and what is sustainable to get there. Also understand this global health pandemic is unlike anything any of us has ever, 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 ever dealt with. The trauma that will come from this, the, the social isolation, the, the absolute fear, the, the different situation each person has, has endured and is enduring, different family situations, different community situations, is real. And there will be trauma from that that needs to heal and needs to be addressed. Um, so just know that nobody really knows and to be very, very careful with yourself. Because this is not, as I said, the time for higher, faster, stronger. This is a gentle time that needs to be very, very, very much eased into for each person. I think that's important to mention, Clara, because, you know, we're modeling some of this research right now on how people are dealing post-COVID or during the... We're not sure when the end of COVID will be, right? So um, during COVID, but during, uh, pardon me, at, at the end of this first wave, at least. Um, and a lot of us are trying to think of it in a way uh, of other trauma or like natural disasters, things like that. And what happens is we get a lot of support right away, some communities do, and then that support often falls away. And what we find is the mental health concerns come up down the road. So um, yeah. stretching out that support down the road, I think Peter would be another one to really consider there. Great, great advice. Rally, any any tips? Uh, what was the question again? Sorry, I was really uh, in the zone thinking about it. <laughs> Sorry about yeah, it. that's good. That's okay. I, I, we were sort of talking about this sort of making a return to sport and what sort of things do we need to look out for to make sure that we maintain our mental health and, and look out for ourselves? Okay, uh, so with me, you know, um, before I was about to leave overseas, uh, of course, you know, there's a strict diet and a training regimen. And I was kind of glad that I was kind of like, uh, it's a hit and miss for me because when I was about to depart, my flight got suspended. And then we got called into work about uh, like a game plan on uh, how we're going to uh, prevent COVID-19 reaching Sixka and so on. And of course, um, at the time I was operating the COVID-19 information call line in which I was like working there for uh, like a month straight, just like every day and like, 12 hours of the day and so um I didn't have time to like train and whatnot so I just pretty much was enjoying the food I would say for the past six weeks <laughs> and it's kind of a it's kind of a unhealthy cycle but then again I really I really enjoyed the food the downtime because uh oh my gosh I probably eaten two bannock cheeseburgers in the poutine a day and then of course uh, you gain weight and um and of course that kind of affected me mentally you know going into the month of 
uh, mid-April, early May. And so that kind of messed with my uh, mental health and not only that, but um, <clears throat> all right. so I decided to get back into my healthy regime. I was being active and so I, and then uh, of course I went for a jog with my brother and um, I think it was about the first kilometer in, I started puking and he was just really devastating. He was like, he was like, oh my gosh, Rob, I never seen you like this. It's just, it just, it's heartbreaking. I was like, I was like, shut up and we're gonna get back into shape. And of course, I just took my training serious, got back into the groove and within these weeks, because I, I, I just had a mindset every day, you know, saying like, you know, just take it day by day, your results will come, you know, no matter what, you know, just don't train for what's coming up, just train to be a better person and heal your mind, body and spirit. And so sure enough, I did a time trial the other day and I'm pretty much in great run in shape, but you know, it's just a diet, you know, like I mentioned before, just enjoying my junk food and whatnot. But you know, when um I know I mentioned post COVID, I know it's gonna be uh it's gonna be um I would say it's pretty difficult. You know, a lot of people will will uh adjust to the new normal. You know, of course it took me a while to adjust to the new normal. Not only, not only myself, but you guys I'm sure, you know, like talking through screens, um social distancing, not be able to, you know, with family and your friends. But I know that you know, someday everything will go back to normal and someday that you'll um will all everything this will pass by us. I know that my sister was really devastated because she just wants to graduate this year and we ended up having like a small barbecue for her and you know, she was glad that that we did something for her and I know that um sixty guys plan to do like a little drive by uh graduation ceremony or whatnot and so um but yeah, you know my advice is just always keep your head up. You know, like uh, I'll I'll say like a little Blackfoot story, oral story. I know that uh, as I mentioned before, my name Brandon Buffalo. You know, like this is one big storm. We're all in this together. You know, we're all buffaloes here. We're all gonna march through the storm. We're not gonna turn away, turn our backs. We're just gonna keep marching on, and together we can do this. And I have faith in everyone. And I know that uh, Mother Earth will take care of us. And I know that one day that we'll all look back to this moment and say, you know what, I survived this and it challenged me mentally. It made me a stronger person. It made me reach that moment that I want to get to my life, whether it's a goal or, or whatever you're trying to achieve in life. So yeah, I would say that's pretty much my advice. Great. Thanks, Riley. And um, Jamie, I think we've got a question and then we'll maybe look to wrap up. Jamie, you're on mute if you're Sorry, I was on mute there. There was a question that came in in the Q&A, um, just hearing about there's a perception that young people today are less resilient and are battling higher levels of anxiety than, than previous generations. Just curious if anybody had any thoughts about um, is that perception uh, true? And if so, is there any factors that you think contribute to that? I'll jump in on this, if that's okay. Um, I think I'm unmuted, I believe. Yeah, I think um, that there are a few different reasons for that. I think one of those reasons is that we're talking about it more and we're recognizing it a little bit more. So while I think there may be a higher prevalence, I think it's it's out there in the public a little bit more and people are more comfortable talking about it. But I also think to kind of create those um, those challenging environments, we need to give athletes some independence again. And I think that it's been years of telling people exactly what to do, follow this perfect formula. And I think that sometimes athletes lose control of that ownership of their goals. And so motivation tends to go down a little bit. And then we find higher anxiety because we're training hard, but we're not getting to our goals. Um, so I do think it's, it's kind of two pronged there, that it's not just you know, new uh, younger people are all anxious. I think that there's some ways that we can foster better environments for that to kind of help to increase that self-confidence and, uh, and in turn work with that motivation. So I think it comes down to environment a lot of the time. Yeah, and I also, if I can add to that, the most resilient person I know is actually with us. It's Riley Many Bears. And Riley, you, um, I'm so grateful for our continued friendship. Um, everything that you've shared today shows me that that question is is no that here is a young athlete a young person a champion who's who's just the example of resilience um not only resilience and coming back from really difficult things growing from challenges but from community connection i have learned so much from you riley and i continue to learn what community means and what that connection means the connection to earth, connection to 
humanity. And, um, and I hope everyone can be inspired by Riley today. He's a, he's a really good friend of mine and, and someone that I will continue to learn from. So yeah, I think young people have the capacity to be incredibly resilient, incredibly resilient. You have to give them the chance to be. And um, I always learned and, and was inspired and gained a lot of resilience from the examples of people that were around me that I was exposed to. And um, today's no exception. Thanks, Riley. That's awesome. Thanks, Clara. Thanks, Elaine and Riley. Um, I think we're almost out of time. So I think in order to wrap up, I'd just like to sort of thank you know, the three panelists we've had today. Elaine, thank you so much for moderating and, and sort of facilitating the conversation. Clara, for your contribution uh, and helping us understand and, and hear about your journey. And similarly, Riley, you know, incredible journey that you've had to, you know, overcome and, and, and you work through on a daily basis. So on behalf of the whole team at the Oval and, and Clara, thanks for the plug for the, for the team at the Oval and everybody that contributes to the whole Petri dish. Um, we'll continue to try and make it a non-Petri dish going forward. But, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, thanks ever so much. And Elaine, I think maybe over to you for a few closing comments. And we're, we'll close yeah. it off. Thanks so much for uh, thanks so much, Peter, for and Jamie Eats for hosting this today. I think um, I think that you've already gotten kind of all the all the big stuff. Just make sure in these uh, you know in these in these times as we're starting to maybe come back to train soon, um, get your information from accredited sources. Take those social media and news breaks uh, as you can. Make sure you're socially connecting and only physical distancing, not socially distancing with your friends, family, teammates, and other support systems. Like Riley said, focus on what we control. If we can control those controllables, we're, uh, we're a lot better off. Um, maintaining that sense of routine and as much as we can, that mental recovery and a big, big piece of that, sleep, sleep, sleep. I know there's a lot of people binging a lot of Netflix out there and that's okay, but make sure we're sleeping too. And that, uh, that is such a big part of our mental well-being. So Thanks to Peter, thanks to Jamie, thanks to Riley and Clara for uh, being so vulnerable and being able to share your stories with us today. Absolute pleasure, thank you ever so much. And Jamie, over to you just to finish us yeah. off and wrap us up. Yeah, thank you so much for attending. Everyone's gonna receive an email uh, follow-up tomorrow. Uh, if you have any other feedback, there'll be a contact email within that. And once again, thank you to our, our panel here for these conversations and we look forward to further conversations uh, throughout this uh, period. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.